from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, I have the great honor today of introducing and chatting with someone whose work and literary reputation you already know very well. He is both a master storyteller and a whole story in himself. He is a writer who has produced more than a dozen magnificent works of fiction. Almost 20 years ago, he became overnight the world's most famous living dissident writer, although he had never uttered a word of dissent. You know, actually, I have to say, it's kind of extraordinary because it's exactly 20 years ago. Yesterday yes. was the 20th anniversary of the publication of the Satanic Verses. There you so are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Salman Rushdie was born in Bombay weeks before the Indian partition. Although he did his early schooling in the city of his birth, he was eventually sent away to study at the famous rugby school in England. He went on to major in history at Cambridge, King's College, Cambridge. His first book, Grimus, a science fiction story of sorts, was published when he was still a young writer, uh, ad writer, I would say, I think that's what you were, uh, at a London advertising agency. He was a mere 27 years old. His second book, Midnight's Children, a stirring story about the tumultuous birth of modern India, catapulted him to world fame. Midnight's Children won the prestigious Booker Prize in 1981, and then it won it twice again, when it was named the best of the Bookers in 1993, and then renamed the best of the Bookers again this year, 2008. Since Midnight's Children, he has produced a proverbial cornucopia of richly innovative fiction, Shame, The Jaguar's Smile, The Moor's Last Sigh, The Ground Beneath Her Feet, Shalimar the Crown. His fourth novel, The Satanic Verses, published in 1988, as we have said, garnered him a death sentence when the Ayatollah Khomeini declared it an insult to Islam so dire that it should be answered with an execution. The reaction to the Ayatollah's fatwa sparked violence around the world and forced Rushdie into hiding for almost a decade. But it didn't stop him from writing or from participating in the larger community of authors. In the interim, he has been the president of the Penn American Center, a fellow in the Royal Society of Literature, and a distinguished writer in, the, in residence at Emory University. Just last year, Queen Elizabeth awarded him with a knighthood for his services to world literature. In France, he has been proclaimed a commander of the Order of Arts and Letters, and just this past May, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Here to talk about his latest novel, The Enchantress of Florence, in, in itself an enchantment. He has graciously agreed to take my questions and yours. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Sir Salman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really used to this, this knighthood business. Uh, oh yeah, hold on, I'll do this. Um, there's actually, I have a, f a friend in New York who has a very precocious eight-year-old daughter who was very excited when she heard about the knighthood. And then when she met me again on Union Square, she looked kind of disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she expected a sword and scabbard. Yeah, so she didn't know quite how to say it. So she said, what she said was, so Salman, how's the whole knight thing going? <laughs> 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 Which meant, you know, where's your horse, dude? You know, <laughs> where's the armor? Where's right. Excalibur? You know, well, you don't get any of that. Right. <laughs> well, let's get this out of the way right now because uh, all of us here under the tent with you today who become very aware of the very strict precautions that you had to take in the past 20 years. Yeah. We're all wondering first, how is it possible to live and work as you have under a death threat? And secondly, how, what persuaded you that now is the time to walk out here among us freely? Well, it's not now. I mean, it's been all, actually, truth is, it's been, mm -hmm. it's been all right for almost 10 years. Um, but, um, 
And also, it didn't, it, it didn't become all right overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there was a sort of gradual process. I mean, I think that one of the interesting things about the world is that in the end, the subject changes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, uh, and no matter how interested people are in or were at one point in, in, in that very unpleasant business, in the end, people lose interest. You know, they, got, they have other people to kill. <laughs> <laughs> you, maybe. <laughs> was, was there a specific event that persuaded yeah. you that maybe it was time to... No, because I mean, actually, as I say, it, it became normal over a period of time. But I suppose the final thing was just about 10... Actually, it was just the General Assembly. So it was just about 10 years ago at the United Nations mm -hmm. um, that the Iranians under, I have to say, pressure exercised both by the Clinton administration and by the British government finally decided to, to back down, withdraw the threat. So that was, that was sort of the, that was the official end, but it really had got better a little bit before that. Now I understand you're keeping a journal, or you kept a journal actually. Is this, uh, will you publish it? Will you do something well, with it that? Well wasn't, it wasn't like a very, it, w it wasn't a journal in the, uh, no I couldn't publish it. I mean it was very much in, it was occasional and it was in note form and often very kind of, you know, only I would understand it because it's very, telegraphies and uh, yeah I just thought that there uh, was a certain point in which the uh, the intensity of event was so great that there was no way that you could remember it mm -hmm. you know uh, there was so much detail so much stuff going on that I thought I better write it down so I mean, I've never really been a diary keeper um, but at that point I, I thought I better do this so there is there is that material and some of it's in written diaries and some of it's in electronic form and you know, one of these days, I guess I have to write that book. But Would it be a fiction book? No. No. Because I think the thing that is interesting about what happened is that it was non-fictional. You know, the, 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 the thing that's sort of horrifying about it is that it became possible in the late 20th century for the tyrannical ruler of a medieval theocracy um, to issue a death threat against not just me, you know, publishers, translators, booksellers, Etc. And, and then seek to carry it out by the use of international terrorism. Mm. Um, I mean, that was the thing. If that was a novel, it would seem implausible. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and I think one of the awful things about what happened was that a thing that should have been unthinkable became thinkable. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and um, so, no, if I do write about it, then I'll certainly, I think, it, uh, how could I make up a writer, not me, <laughs> to whom all that stuff happened? Right. You know? <laughs> Um, it, it just, and why would you bother to do it? You know, I think, no, you, I would, I mean, actually there's a lot of, the truth is that even though it was so much written about, um, most of what really happened has never been written about. Mm. You know, um, and so in that sense, there is one hell of a story to tell. But oddly, I'm not very interested in telling it. And, and, and when I think the thing is that I spent, what was it, nine years of my life going through that, and it wasn't fun, believe me. Um, if you could possibly avoid being sentenced to death by the tyrannical <laughs> leader, of a, <laughs> I would strongly recommend that you, you do so. On the other hand, I should, would just like to point out that one of us is dead. Um, <laughs> you don't mess with novelists. <laughs> Now, speaking of novelists, the, the Enchantress of Florence is like all your novels, a great marvelous stew of a book. Uh, with a difference, for me, it harks back to the old romances. Uh, an emperor dreams his ideal mistress into existence. A Florentine orphan rises to become a great warrior for Islam. A black-eyed beauty casts a spell on every man who beholds her. Not only that, but wandering the corridors of this story are Machiavelli, Botticelli, Amerigo Vespucci, Andrea Doria, and Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> yeah, that was, I must say, <laughs> when I was doing the research for the book and I discovered that there actually was, at exactly the right time, a, a, a battle or a cam military campaign led by the Ottoman Turks against Dracula. Mm. You know, so that I could actually have Dracula in my novel, you know, <laughs> uh, without cheating. <laughs> it, I just, I thought, I thought I'd just have gone to heaven, really. You know, and, and of course, the thing about him, it's only a little, little bit of the book, but still. 
I mean, he wasn't a vampire. I mean, there's, there's no real evidence of vampirism. That's something that Bram Stoker made up in his novel. But he was so bloodthirsty that actually a little vampirism would have been light relief, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's a scene in the book where, in order to defend himself against the advancing army of the Turks, he impales 20,000 human beings on stakes around the town in which he's besieged. Mm. And I didn't make that up. He did that. Um, and as somebody who's capable of killing 20,000 people just to scare the advancing army, I mean, that's, you know, vampires have nothing on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what inspired you to write this um, extraordinary novel? Well, it, it, well, I suppose a starting point is that a thing that I think has become more and more the subject I'm most interested in is that the world in which we live is no longer segregated. You know, the East and the West, the North and the South, um, you know, America and the Arab world, whatever, these are not separate anymore. You know, their stories are all interconnected now. Um, and so I wanted to write about, if you like, the beginning, the birth of what we now think of as the modern world, and to see how that process of interconnectedness happened at the very beginning. You know, and this time, the end of the 15th century, the first half of the 16th century, it's really the time at which we were discovering each other. You know, it was the moment at which the first European travelers went to India. Um, it was the moment at which the interaction between uh, the Ottoman Empire and, and the Renaissance, you know, became quite complex and rich and mutually beneficial in many ways. And um, so it was just the, you know, you have to imagine this world. If you go from east to west, you forget about China and Japan because they were so sealed off that they were sort of separate. But in the East, you have India, the, the great Mughal Empire at its peak in the 16th century. To the West of that, you had an area which then as now was composed of barbaric warlords. Uh, it was then called, then called Khorasan. Now we would call it Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Um, to the West of that, you had the beginnings of Shia, Persia, the, the beginnings of the Safavid Persian Empire. To the west of that, you had the early days of the Ottoman Empire, just established. You know, the Turks conquered Constantinople in 1453, so the second half of the 15th century sees the birth of, of what we now think of as Turkey. Mm -hmm. To the west of that, you have Europe, Europe in the middle of the High Renaissance. To the west of that, you have a, an expanse of water, which at that point was known as the Ocean Sea. Um, in which there was supposed to be a number of problems. If you sailed west across the Ocean Sea, the first thing that would happen is that your ship would be eaten by giant ship-eating monsters. Right? Um, if you could avoid the ship-eating monsters, which you couldn't, but if you did, you would, you would get to a point where the sea turned to mud and your ship would be stuck in the mud. So if you could avoid the ship-eating monsters and the mud, <laughs> which, which you couldn't, but if you did, your prize for doing that would be to fall off the end of the world. <laughs> uh, and that idea had, was current only 40 or 50 years before this period. You know. um, but at this period, of course, what had happened is the beginning of just bubbling up on the Western horizon was this weird place called the New World. Um, so that's, it seems to be just such a fascinating moment in history where everything is beginning. Modern India is beginning. You know, modern Persia is beginning. The modern Turkey is beginning. Modern Europe is reaching its great flowering at the time of the Renaissance. And America is beginning, mm -hmm. you know. And, and to set a book in that period, I thought sometimes if you go back to the beginnings of things, you learn a lot about the way they turned out, mm -hmm. you know. And I suppose that was the original motivation. Indeed, and, and it's such a crossroads in history. But, you know, I have tried every which way to, to um, characterize this novel, or the plot of the novel, for this audience. And it, like all of your novels, uh, Salman, they defy description. How do you, how do you summarize in a, in a nutshell what, yes, what happens in <laughs> yes, this sir. novel? It's not that hard. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Okay, there's this, there's this princess of the Mughal Empire who gets mislaid. Um, she gets captured by a rival warlord. Then she, he gets defeated, and she comes into the possession of the Shah of Persia, who she decides she's, 
she fancies, so she stays with him. Then he gets defeated um, by the Turks, and the, leading the Turkish army is this, is this very handsome warrior who's this, Tur this Italian orphan who's risen to, uh, to eminence in the Turkish army. And they fall in love. He brings her back to, to Europe, to, to his home city of Florence, where she creates an enormous amount of trouble, and she's probably a witch. <laughs> yeah. That sums uh, it up. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, and I guess, you know, s since we've all heard about Sarah Palin's interest in witchcraft, um, this, is, this is a very contemporary novel. <laughs> <laughs> Now, speaking, speaking of Sarah Palin, yeah. in his review for us in Book World, Michael Durda said that your book was in many ways, uh, and I quote here, a dream of fair women. It does seem to be a kind of paean to female beauty, a, a sibling somehow to the writings of, oh, you know, Garcia Marquez or Vargas Llosa. Um, are you a Pygmalion of sorts, a, a writer who falls in love with the women he creates? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to say there, William. <laughs> no, I, one of the things that interested me, what, a thing that happens in the art of the Renaissance, is that until just about this moment, when witches, sorceresses, were depicted in art, they were always depicted as hideous. They were always depicted as hags. You know, hunchbacks with noses, with warts, with all kinds of disfigurements. And then in the Renaissance, people became very interested in antiquity. They read again the ancient myths of Greece and Rome. And there they found beautiful witches. You know, they found Circe, so on. And so suddenly, in the art of the Renaissance, the image of the witch is transformed it ceases to be the hag or the crone, and it becomes the beautiful seductress, the enchantress. And they paint it over and over and over again. And it struck me that that's, first of all, it's interesting, this, u this bringing together of erotic power and occult power, you know, I in the minds of Renaissance men and women. And I thought this is potentially, of course, it's a very two-edged sword for, for a woman to be seen as being possessor of both these abilities as the character of the novel comes to be seen in when she gets to Italy. Uh, she comes to be seen as a purveyor of miracles as well as as a great beauty. And it struck me that that's, first of all, it, it initially it gets you more sort of extra adoration, mm -hmm. you know. But if the public mood changes, you know, something happens, that, that can spin on a dime and the same people who were worshipping you one day can come around to burn you at the stake, you know, the next day. Um, and that's also a problem she has to face. And I remember, you know, a friend of mine, the British writer Marina Warner, long ago wrote brilliantly about, about the subject of witchcraft. Um, and, and one of the things she said is that the familiar objects by which a witch was supposed to be defined, you would find in every woman's kitchen. You know, the, the, the pointed hat, everybody wore that kind of hat. You know, um, the broomstick, everybody's got a broomstick. You know, uh, the, the familiar animal, many houses had cats. Um, even the idea of, the, of the, the, the third nipple, you know, the witch's tit, in an age when many, many bodies had warts and moles and so on, uh, it was very easy to identify that, you know, to say there it is. So essentially the only thing that was remaining was the accusation of the witch. The moment you pointed at a woman and said, she's a witch, you could prove it. You know, um, I mean, Ol Oliver Cromwell actually had a government minister, a man called Matthew Hopkins, who was, whose official title was Witchfinder General. Um, and his job, and he killed thousands of women, thousands of women. He went round the country and, and looking for witches, and basically, in villages, people would denounce the most unpopular woman in town. You know? and, and one of his tests was that he would weigh them down with stones and throw them into a river. And if they floated, they were obviously witches and would therefore have to be burned. If they sank and drowned, they were obviously innocent. Um, so it's a difficult one to get out of. You know? so, um, but so I want that idea of beauty and eroticism creating a knife edge to walk, you know, which can be briefly 
create possibilities, etc., but can also endanger the person. You know, I wanted the character to walk on that on that knife edge. Right. Now, your novels are so playful, and we get, we we get a sense of that just hearing him, don't we? Because he's 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 uh, identifying these. Uh, cruxes in history, and he's putting, th throwing together these figures we never might have imagined uh, would live in the same time and, and work in the same novel. But you, he's always equally uh, as playful in language. And Salman, you are you you, you that is your really your trademark for for me in many ways is your the the playful way. Particularly, I'm thinking of the ground beneath her feet. Uh, I'm thinking of Shalimar the Clown. Uh, there is a, a very playful quality in your writing, in the language itself. Where does that come from? I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It comes from me. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I know I, that. I, it just, you know, it comes out that way. You, um, but you mix languages. You, yeah. There's a kind of Creole. There's a Salman Rushdie well, Creole. That's, that is to do, I think that is to do with growing up in India, because if, if you grow up in India, Everybody speaks more than one language. Everybody, uh, because you have to. Otherwise, you can't talk to anyone. Um, you know, in Bombay, where I grew up, um, my mother tongue was Urdu. The national language was Hindi. The regional languages were Marathi and Gujarati. And the school I went to uh, taught us in English. So that's five languages just for a start. You know, and if you grow up like that, and you know some languages well, some not so well. Um, you find yourself quite naturally playing language games. You know, so you will use, even if you're speaking English, you might use a Hindi word because it seems more appropriate or, you know, or, a, or a saying or something you know, which illustrates your point better. So people speak this kind of um, mishmash mm -hmm. of a language. Um, and it encourages, I think, a kind of playfulness mm -hmm. with language. And so you grow up like that, at least I did. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes out of that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, well, and also, uh, speaking of, of mishmash, uh, there is a sense I feel in your your no, uh, your novels that there you're talking about the globalization of cultures. You're uh, you, you've mentioned the knowing five languages, but you're also throwing worlds together, throwing whole cultures together. This was also uh, evident to me in the ground beneath her feet. Also, all, well, all of them, all, every single one of your novels, um, in which. Uh, you know, worlds do combine. Now, the critics have all, always credited you for being uh, someone who really was the pioneer of post-colonial literature. But I would also venture to say that you are a pioneer of post-globalization literature as well. Um, is this something that you wanted to capture intentionally in your books? Well, the, 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 the latter, I think, Yes, I think, because I do think, as I was saying before, that we live in this very interconnected world now. And, and I think it is a kind of a problem for the novel, because there's something about the art of the novel that wants to be parochial. You know, the novel wants to be about a bunch of girls in a northern English village looking for husbands. You know, it, 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 it wants to be about a bourgeois housewife in rural France who's bored with her husband and wants to have an affair. You know, that, that kind of... Um, small-scale intimacy, provi almost provincialism, you know, it seems to me is natural to the novel, maybe even intrinsic to it. And so the novel actually resists trying to be this big canvas thing which is about everything at once, you know. And yet, uh, yet we now live in a world in which that's the canvas, you know, in which our lives are affected every day by things happening very far away. And, and, and even if we look at the people amongst us, they come from everywhere. And, um, and in order to just simply in order to understand this world, we have to think about it in this other non-provincial, non-intimate way. And the question then is how to preserve the intimate space in which people can have human relations and so on inside that larger canvas. It's difficult, you know, but I think I just think it is it's necessary because it seems to me to be the way of reflecting what's happened to the world in which we live, which is no longer small. Indeed. And this is going to be my last question before I invite you up to the microphones. But this is a very nervous time in America, Salman. And yeah. We're a country at war, and we are battling a financial crisis. And we are increasingly hated, it seems, around the world, at least as a, uh, as a government. What do you, someone with his feet on both sides, east and west, as you put it, 
have to say about, uh, to, to us about America's place in the world? What advice uh, would you give us here <laughs> and now? <laughs> well, I, just, I suppose I could sum it up in two words. I could say, remember the fourth. If you look back as recently as the Clinton administration, this was not how the world saw America. You know, the, the actual relationship between America and much of the rest of the world was just fine, you know, as recently as eight years ago then, I don't know, some kind of curious missteps took place. Um, and, um, and now you have a chance to put it right, and don't screw it up this time. <laughs> okay, do we have some questions for Salman Rushdie? Yeah. Step up to the microphone, please. Where are the microphones? Does this yes. work? Yeah. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Mariana, you quoted uh, Michael Dirda, his book review of Salman Rushdie's uh, novel, The Enchantress of Florence. He also mentions in that, uh, he says that uh, this is not really a novel, it's a summer fling. <laughs> now, I kind of disagree with that because it's a substantive novel, as all his novels usually are. Uh, to, to my mind, you know, the famous line of Rudyard Kipling comes, which says that East is East and West is West and never the twain will meet. Now, Salman Rushdie's work is a repudiation of that famous quote from Rudyard Kipling. The question is, for example, uh, I, uh, there were two quotes beautiful uh, from this novel, which are, the one is, we are their dream and they are ours. That's a beautiful statement of East and West. And the other line, this may be the curse of the human race, not that they are so different from one another, but that we are so alike. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah, the question is, <laughs> the question is that you have uh, reached out to the West. Do you think of any other uh, writer, Western writer, who has reached out the same way to the East? The East uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what a novel is. Um, so when, when somebody says this isn't exactly a novel, I mean, you'd have to have a very clear view of what the form was. I think one of the great things about the novel form is that it's so diverse and so flexible and so variable. So many kinds of narrative can be encompassed within it. You know, the, uh, the American critic Randall Jarrell once wonderfully said that a novel is a long piece of writing that has something wrong with it. <laughs> and, and I do think that kind of imperfection is a part of what it is. But I mean, I do th there are, there are um, Western writers who have written very well about, I mean, you mentioned Kipling. I mean, Kipling, I think, is a very complex figure because in some ways he's colonialist and borderline racist. In other ways, he, understand, he understood India very well. E.M. Forster, another such person. I mean, yes, there are. I mean, even John Irving wrote a novel about India. And I suspect that as India becomes better known in the West, which it's becoming, that that, that, that will only increase, that, that two-way transaction. I think the best recent novel, I would say, is J.G. Farrell's wonderful novel about the Indian mutiny called The Siege of Krishnapur. And if people have not read it, I strongly recommend they do. I'm being told that we are running over time, so we are going to have to close the session now. I want to thank you, uh, Salman Rushdie, for coming out to be with us thank you. today. And thank all of you for coming to listen to him. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.